the Lord within a palace, this is for a refuge known. For lo, the kings that gathered were together by her gone. But when they did behold the same, they wandering would not stay. But being troubled at the sight, they thence did haste away. Great terror there to call on them, they were possessed with fear. Their grief came like a woman's pain when she a child doth bear. Thou trashy ship the east wind break, as we have heard it told. So in the city of the Lord our eyes did it behold. In our God city which is hand for ever establish will, we all shall have in kindness thought, Lord, in thy counsel still. From verse 2, six stanzas, Mount Zion stands most beautiful, the joy of all the land.
Sean Murder Martin to do this in prayer. Let us pray. from Psalm 78, verses 4 to 8. Psalm 78, verses 4 to 8. We could read from the beginning of the psalm, Attend my people to my law, there to give them an ear. <coughs> the words that from my mouth proceed attentively do hear. My mouth shall speak a parable and sing down to all the same which we have heard and known and that our fathers told. We also will have not concealed from their posterity them to the generation to come, declare will we. The praises of the Lord our God and his almighty strength, the wondrous works that he hath done, we will show forth at length. His testimony and his law in Israel he did place and charged her father she to show to their succeeding race, that so the race which was to come might well them learn and know, and sons and born who should arise might to their sons them show, that they might set their hope in God and suffer not to fall, his mighty works out of their mind, but keep his precepts all. So and, and so on to down to verse eight from verse four then. In verse 8, we also will them not conceal from their posterity. <coughs>
Peter, the Word of God, two readings, and the first reading is from the Epistle of Paul to the Colossians from chapter 1. an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the sin, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. <coughs> that ye might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, and to all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were some time alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of, what is the riches of, the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. 
wherein do I also labor, striving according to his working, which he worketh in me my grace. And again from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, and reading from verse 32. The Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 11, and reading from verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, walked valiant in fight, Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. We men received the dead, raised to life, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, they moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report, through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So God bless to us. The reading of his own word, in his name, to the glory and the praise. Let us now sing to God's praise from the 132nd Psalm. Psalm 132 and reading from verse 12. <coughs> My covenant, if thy sons will keep, and law to them made known, their children then shall also sit forever on thy throne. But God of Zion hath made choice, there he desires to dwell. This is my rest, here still I'll stay, for I do like it well. Her food I'll greatly bless, her poor with bread will satisfy. Her priests I'll clothe with health, her saints shall shout forth joyfully. And there will I make David's horn to bud forth pleasantly. For him that mine anointed is a lamp ordained have I. As with a garment I will clothe, would shame his enemies all. But yet the crown that he doth wear upon him flourish shall. <coughs> Psalm 132, from the twelfth verse. My covenant if thy sons will keep, and law to them made known. My covenant, my
turn to our first reading in the Epistle of Paul to Colossians chapter 1 and take verse 18 and he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence <coughs> now as explained to you last week the, the 150th anniversary of the disruption was commemorated on the 18th of May and the church session decided that we should also have some, something to commemorate uh, the disruption to have held a meeting during the week we know very well only the prayer meeting people, people would have attended and maybe a few more and hence we felt it was best to have it on the Lord's Day because after all in the whole history of our church and the stand it took in, 19, in 1843 and 1900 all that must be seen in the light of scripture first if we go back to 1560 to the Reformation in Scotland we see that uh, important doctrine that was very much to the fore at that time was the headship of Christ and that is the point that was brought to uh, King James VI by Andrew Melville when he said to him there are two kings and two kingdoms in Scotland. There is King James VI, who is King of the Commonwealth, and King Jesus, who is Head of the Church, who is subject James VI is. And of whose kingdom he is neither a head, nor a king, nor a lord, but a member. And that was what the Reformers fought for the headship of Christ he is head of his church and in the Bible the church is spoken of as his mystical body and he is the head of that mystical body and from the head the body all its members receive nourishment and receive their life and their strength when we move forward to 1843 we see two other important doctrines to the fore there. Uh, first of all, the doctrine of the Word of God, which is the only rule to direct us for faith and conduct, and also the spiritual independence of the Church. First, friends, we have the Word of God. And God, in His infinite wisdom, gave us His own Word. And you know it is impertinent of the highest order when people take upon themselves to introduce into the public worship of God things that are contrary to the golden rule he has left of himself. Do we think for one moment that God overlooked such matters? He has set a table he has furnished a table there for his church in the wilderness. Everything is on it. Everything is on that table for our spiritual nourishment to guide us in the affairs of this life, for discipline, for everything else. It is all there. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. But we also see the spiritual independence of the church. <coughs> And that spiritual independence is inherent in the church. And the church is left to govern her own spiritual affairs according to this rule. And these are the things that are fundamental to our appreciation of and understanding of the disruption and what the disruption fathers for for. Now we find that the state was invading the prerogatives of the church prior to 1843 and trying to take over 
the spiritual affairs of the church. What were these godly men going to do? Were they going to sit back and do nothing? Sit back, friends, and forget that Christ was the head of the church, that Christ had given spiritual independence to the church. But they're going to sit back and do nothing and allow all these things which the, the Reformation fathers had fought for, to allow these things to go by the board and allow the state to move in and to control such matters. Not at all. These men were determined to fight. These men were determined to stand their ground. These men were determined to protect the church, to protect the legacy that was theirs. And they were to prove that they were worthy beneficiaries of that legacy. And I feel that it is important in our day to bring these matters before our people because there are too many within our congregations who are prepared to erode distinctives. And we must hold on to such precious doctrines and be thankful to God for what he has delivered to us. There isn't a perfect church this side of heaven, but there are a number of things that we can thank God for. First, that we still have his infallible word. That we preach the whole counsel of God and that we have purity of worship. We can lay claim to such things. As I said, there is no church perfect. We come down badly maybe in other things. But we are thankful to God we have all this. Now I'm only just selecting various points from the history of the disruption right up to 1900 if we were going to go into detail we would get bogged down and I think we would lose the main train of things now to give you an example of how absurd the situation was I will first of all look at uh, an instance there that took place within the presbytery of the radar it involved a Mr. Young, and they tried to impose that Mr. Young on a congregation that didn't want them. Only two people within the congregation wanted them. And remember, the congregations in those days weren't made up of a few dozen people. They, there were hundreds upon hundreds in that congregation. And here he was being imposed on them against the wishes of the people. In our own day, when a congregation is vacant, unless 60% of the members support a name that has been moved, the presbytery cannot sustain that call. Here you had a situation where you had two people wanted a man and the rest didn't want them. The presbytery, of course, refused to ordain that man and induct him to that charge. The matter was taken to the court of session. The court of session charged the church and the presbytery with acting unlawfully. The case was taken to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords came to the same conclusion that the church was unlawful in what she was doing, that the presbytery had acted unlawfully, that the presbytery were there willfully breaking the law. Uh, that reminds us of the absurdity of it all. And here was an instance where the presbytery was firmly upon the rock of Scripture, never having departed from it, and yet the state charging the church was acting unlawfully. The second example is taken from the presbytery of Dunkeld, and it involves a Mr. Clark. Now, the, the Mr. Clark was being imposed on the congregation, and that presbytery refused to ordain Mr. Clark, Clark, and they ordained instead a Mr. Hesse in the face of an interdict from the court of session. And simply by a whisper, these men escaped imprisonment. That was the second example. You can see for yourself 
how tension was mounting between church and state. That should never be. Church and state should work together, alongside each other, not in conflict with each other. And then the third example involves a Mr. Edwards within the Presbytery of Strathbogie. Seven, <coughs> seven members or ministers of that presbytery took upon themselves to induct, to ordain and induct Mr. Edwards in defiance of the General Assembly finding. These men, of course, appealed to the court of session. They were suspended by the church and eventually deposed. Now, just in the passing, I want just to explain to you just what it is to depose a minister. Very often, the sentence that is passed on a minister within our church when he errs and he has to, to uh, resign from his charge and not allowed to preach, he is normally suspended sine dea. That is, no definitely is intimated. And the duty of the presbytery during that suspension is to keep in touch with that man, to see if that man will show signs of repentance. If he shows signs of repentance, they are supposed to report back to the General Assembly, who alone has power to lift that suspension. If after a prolonged period he shows no signs of repentance, then that information is related to the General Assembly, and the General Assembly might then proceed toward deposing the man. When a person is deposed, his license is removed from him, he is in a literal sense uh, unfrocked, and that's the end of his days in the ministry. And that reminds me, reason for, for raising that point to show you the seriousness of what these seven men took upon themselves and how the church used the action that they had taken. There we have just a few uh, points selected from here to show you the state of things. And this was leading up to 1843. On the 18th of May, 1843, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland met. Now the procedure, I think I should just pause at this point and just remind you of, of, of how our Presbyterian form of church government functions. I feel very often there's ignorance amongst their people. We have four courts within our system of church government. That is, four courts that have the spiritual oversight of the congregation. We've got, got deacons go at a local level and they look after the fabric and money and such things. The first court is the church session. The church session consists of the minister of the congregation who is the moderator of that church session and the elders. In the event of a congregation being vacant, you have an interim moderator appointed by the presbytery, and he acts in the place of the moderator. And the moderator of a church session is a moderator on a permanent basis. As long as he is minister of the congregation, he remains as moderator of that church session. The second highest court is the presbytery. The moderator of the presbytery is only appointed but for one year, and it works round the whole presbytery. In uh, my former presbytery, it, we work round the whole presbytery. In the presbytery of Lewis here, seemingly the pastor, and he's the last man into the presbytery, he acts as moderator. Of course, that pastor would continue as long as you had new men to be the pastor. If not, of course, they would have to adopt the same practice as we had down south. Then you have the next highest court called the Synod. It's a court of review, and it meets but once per year. Again, you have one minister appointed as moderator. He runs his course for the year, and another man takes over. And the highest court of all is the General Assembly. That is where the laws are all being made. And you cannot appeal against the finding of the, of the General Assembly. Let's say there was somebody in this congregation, and he or she felt that they had received a raw deal from the church session. 
they could appeal to the presbytery. And let's say the presbytery, they felt the presbytery hadn't handled the case justly. They can appeal to the synod. They eventually would go to the General Assembly. And at the end of the day, General Assembly would throw out their case. They couldn't appeal against that. That is final. And in the General Assembly, you have again one minister, and he acts as mother for the year. And in 1843, on the 18th of May, 1843, Dr. Welsh, who was the mother there from the previous year, was delivering his address prior to constituting the General Assembly. And having delivered his address, which is delivered from the pulpit of the Assembly Hall, then he comes down into the body of the Assembly Hall, and there, of course, through prayer, the General Assembly is constituted. Having constituted the General Assembly, he then read the protest that was drawn up by the ministers who, of course, eventually uh, left the Church of Scotland. He, he read the protest, and having read the protest, he walked out of the Assembly Hall. And 400 ministers followed him, along with many, many elders. And they made their way then from the Assembly Hall down to the Tanfield Hall. And if you ever go to the Presbytery Hall in the Free Church College, you'll see a huge painting there. I'm sure you've seen it appear in terms of an instructor or the writer. A huge painting by Hill. And it took Hill 15 years to, to paint that picture. And you can appreciate why it took him 15 years. Because he has all the ministers there and others who were present that day. Not in the order in which he has the ministry, but they are all there. And anybody who can do a little, little bit of painting can appreciate how difficult it is to paint even one face, to put a roundness and a flat surface. All that's very difficult. We need to be very skillful. And they went down to the Tanfield Hall, and in the afternoon of that day, the Free Church, uh, um, the Free Church General Assembly, for the first time ever, was constituted. And in the chair as moderator was Dr. Thomas Chalmers. And these are famous names that we must hold on to. Now let us look at the, the, the implications in uh, severing ties with the establishment. The first thing we must keep in mind is this, that they did not sever ties with the establishment principle. The establishment principle was embodied within the protest. What do we mean by the establishment principle? Well, the establishment principle is this. That the church <laughs> believed, the Church of Scotland, prior to this eruption and to this day, of course, they believed that the state should give financial aid to the church. And the disruption fathers never severed ties from that principle. Uh, let me just repeat the words of Dr. Chalmers. We leave, he said, a vitiated establishment, but we would rejoice to return to a pure one. So that the establishment principle was never departed from. Now, against the establishment principle, you have what is called the voluntary principle. And the United Free Church, which emerged in 1900, that is their principle to this day. They will not accept any financial aid from the state. And yet the irony of it all is this. Their theological students will accept the Scottish education grant to be educated in the universities and in the colleges. So what's the difference between accepting a grant from the state to train that their, their students and to accept financial aid from the state if that of course would be available the one thing more or less last of the other but the voluntary the establishment principle was not departed from now consider friends the consequences of having uh, several ties with the establishment if we look at things from a personal viewpoint. These men signed a deed of demission. 
And by signing that deed of demission, it meant that they severed themselves from their salaries, they severed themselves from their home, they lost their manses, they severed themselves from their church building, and in some cases, they severed themselves from their congregation. And that was no mean feat to, in those days, to cut off your salary, cut off your home, cut off your, your connection with church building. And these men had nothing to turn to, they didn't have a penny to turn to, they had no homes to turn to, nothing whatsoever. And that reminds us of how precious the word of God were to these men. That shows you what principles meant to these men, how these men were prepared to suffer the consequences in defending the rights of Christ's church, the independence that belonged, that was inherent in the church, they were prepared to pay the price for it. And it was, friends, a very high price to pay. But the people followed them in the pain of sight. And the 1843 church uh, was a very lively church. A very strong church. They had schools throughout the length and the breadth of the country. They had mission stations throughout the continent. They were, it was a very powerful church in every way. And yet, the sad thing is this, that 20 years later, there was a move to unite with another church in Scotland called the United Presbyterian Church. And to bring about that union meant compromising on the word of God and the subordinate standard. Now you may ask yourself, what went wrong? Why 20 years later in 1863 was there a clamor for union? Well, let us look at statistics. Over 400 ministers left the church in 1843. Some of these ministers were old men in 1843. And even going by their age, many of them were dead by the time you reached 1863. they were subjected to when they didn't have decent homes to live in. They had to live in barns and places that couldn't be heated, that were damp and drafty, and all that took its toll. So by the time we reached 1863, many of these men were gone. And those who had taken their place were of an entirely different caliber altogether. We find then the first moves towards union in 1863. The United Presbyterian Church of, the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland had strong reservations about the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now the Westminster Confession of Faith was part and parcel of the constitution of the Free Church. And to interfere with that, you were interfering with the constitution. So the first moves towards union took place in 1863. Now let us move forward to 1871. The year before, of course, the church had approached Presbyteries to find out their view about uh, this proposed union. And in 1871, the returns from the Presbyteries showed that there were some who were opposed to union. Then an overture was sent to the presbyteries under a barrier in order that steps 
positive steps will be taken towards this proposed union. And we find that in the Free Church we had two very eminent, very powerful men, very influential men, but very subtle men as well, Dr. Rainey and Dr. Candlish. And in the United Presbyterian Church there was a Dr. Kerr. These men were very, very influential men, and they were pushing all the way for union. And eventually we find in 1891 the emergence of the infamous Declaratory Act. I'm quite sure you've often heard of the Declaratory Act. If you are in the Free Presbyterian Church on a Monday for Communion, that is what the whole emphasis would be on, on the Declaratory Act. This is the drum that has often been beaten by them down towards the years, and the Declaratory Act has no relevance whatsoever to our position as the post-1900 Free Church. But the fact is that the Declaratory Act emerged, and the Declaratory Act was a total compromise. It embodied the leading teachings of Arminianism. It formally uh, 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 adopted the voluntary principle, abandoned the establishment principle. Everything was watered down to cater for the United Presbyterian Church so that the two churches would emerge. It was a sad departure from the Word of God, a sad departure from our subordinate standards. Yet, friends, that was the situation. And it wasn't surprising, because at this period in the church, there was a desire amongst many for freedom in, by way of their belief. There was also, of course, a desire to be unshackled from uh, doctrinal statements by the church. And thirdly, there were those within the church who wanted a revision of the subordinate standards. I cannot remember who said it. It sounds like Dr. Stewart. That the system of doctrine set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith was not likely to find favor among people faced with spiritual degeneracy. And that was the, the, the situation in the church at that time. We have to be very careful that we don't allow ourselves into a similar situation. We are living in a day in which there is little appetite for strong meat, little appetite for the strong doctrines of Scripture. I remember a number of years ago being at a communion, and with me was a young man who was maybe a year in the ministry, and what I did notice, and there was nothing wrong with his preaching, his preaching was sound, but what I did notice, that every sermon he preached at that communion, I didn't hear Sabbath morning, so of course I was in a separate building, but I was told it was the same pattern, every sermon he preached at that communion was an evangelistic sermon. There was no word of repentance and um, humiliation and prayer as is normally emphasized on a Thursday for communion. He wasn't preaching on Friday night, Saturday morning. There was no reference to preparation and uh, comfort for the Lord's people. Sabbath evening, of course, that type of sermon was relevant. And again, the same pattern on Monday. But uh, this is what struck me. The minister of the congregation said to me afterward, that is the kind of ministry they want here. That was the kind of ministry they wanted there. A, a, an evangelistic ministry. No word about doctrine, no word about teaching, no word about feeding. I would like to see that congregation in 10 to 20 years' time. What are they going to feed on? How are they going to grow? That's a tragic situation. And if we had that pattern throughout the church, then indeed who can tell what might develop from it. It is all very well to appreciate the milk as babe. We can't remain at that stage. We must grow. 
and we must acquire taste for stronger meat. We must be exercised in these matters. We cannot remain babes. We must become men and women in the faith. Well, however, I haven't sidetracked from what I was saying. That was the situation within the church, and you can appreciate that combined with a clamor to unite, you had there the ingredient for union. So we must also, of course, emphasize this in the, in the passing. Even the constitutionalists who refused to join the union in 1900, they still wanted union, but not friends at, a, at any price. That's the difference. Not at any price. Now, that takes us through to 1891, the emergence of the Declaratory Act. And two years after that, 1893, we have the birth of the Free Presbyterian Church. Two men formed that church, namely Donald McFarlane, minister of the Free Church in the island of Rasi at that time, and another man, Donald MacLeod, who was minister of the Free Church in Shilde. These men felt that everything was lost. Everything was lost. They acted prematurely. Had these men remained patient for seven years, there would be no free Presbyterian church. They felt all was lost. And the point that has been overlooked down to the years is this. Although the Declaratory Act was adopted, it was never implemented in the pre-1900 church, not ever implemented in the post-1900 church. That act was only implemented when the union took place in 1900. And yet they try and make out that the constitutionalists who remained in the pre-1900 church for seven years after the Declaratory Act had been adopted and passed by the General Assembly, that they were compromisers. They weren't. Had these men remained in the church, they could have gone back to Rasse and back to Shilde, and they could have continued preaching and ministering there, the same as they had done up until that moment. Such things hadn't in any way affected the congregation. And so we find then these men broke ranks and formed the Free Presbyterian Church. Then we move on to 1900 itself. And in 1900 we find the Free Church and the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland uniting to form the United Free Church of Scotland. There were only about 27 ministers who refused to join that union. And in many ways, what these men were faced with was more harrowing than what the Disruption Fathers were faced with. The Disruption Fathers, although they faced terrible hardships in severing ties with their salary, mansions, church buildings, yet the multitude supported them. They had tremendous support. But in 1900, these men were in such a tiny minority that they were subjected to a lot of scorn. These men faced great difficulties. And the most prominent men amongst them are Colony Bannatyne, um, John Noble, Minister of Laird, uh, Mr. Cameron, who was Minister at Bath, and Dr. Donald Monroe of Herentosh. But at that assembly, there was no minister from uh, this island who, of course, came out with the constitutionalists because Cameron and the minister in part were the only men on the island who refused to join the union. They were not commissioners that year. And of the 27 men who came out and refused to join the union, two of them were already retired. Elders also came out with them. There were a few men who were training for the ministry who also came out. But it was a much reduced free church. And that explains why there were such long vacancies in the church. My own last congregation was vacant for nearly 30 years. 
all because there was no manpower available. And that was true of many congregations throughout the church. After that, of course, we have a legal battle. These constitutionalists maintain that they never altered the constitution of the church. And hence that they had legal right to all the funds, to the property, or the buildings that belonged to the pre-1900 free church. They took their case to the court of session, and the court of session turned down their case. They tried a second time, appeal, it was turned down. And then they took it to the House of Lords. And the House of Lords, by a majority of five to two, these were the lords who sat judging that case, by a majority of five to two, awarded everything to the free church. Now, consider the implications. There were 44 churches in Edinburgh alone awarded to them. They had colleges in Aberdeen, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh. You had a handful of ministers, a handful of men. How could you handle such an enormous amount of property? Libraries, buildings, and so on. And hence we find that a royal commission was appointed to try and work out some formula whereby all the property and funds would be distributed. But the point of importance here is this, that these men were right. And these men stuck to their ground, and God eventually rewarded them. The next date we have to keep in mind is 1929. It is of less significance. But in 1929, you find that many of these United States churches vanished from off the map. They joined the Church of Scotland. And you have the odd one moving into the free church. Near our own area here, at that time, up to 1900, the Church of Scotland, now at Tarbert, was a free church. Scarfie was a mission station of that church. Why? When there was a big population there, I'll never know. When the Church of Tarbert joined the Union in 1900, Scarfie went in with it. In 1929, Scarfie broke away from the Union and came into the free church. The other situation we have, and of course it's nothing to do with, the, with the, this union, in um, Kilwinny, I think it was in 1959, the, the free church there now was an original secession church up till then, and it came into the free church in 1929. Now, when we look back at history, we see how God has blessed us. We started off in, in 1843 with over 400 ministers. In 1900, we were reduced to 25 active ministers. Two were retired. And now we have grown to approximately having 100 ministers. We have our own high school over in Peru. We have our churches in Southern Africa. Uh, we had a hospital in India. I think that has now been left uh, in the responsibility of uh, the, 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 the people who are uh, operating on the scene there. But we have made these strides. We're trying to establish new congregations in various areas of Scotland. In recent years, we've seen the emergence of Drum Chapel, Cumbernauld, East Kilbride, Lennox Town, Dunblane, Smithton, uh, Livingstone, Glen Rothes, and more recently, of course, and the problem we are faced with now is more for primarily a spiritual one how much we need God to revive us and secondly a financial one you can't move without finances now I felt friend that it was important to bring these facts before you there are others and they have the history of their own denomination at their fingertips and in our own denomination, I feel that there is a lot of ignorance about these matters. So I keep some of these dates before you. 1843, the disruption. 1891, the declaratory act. 1893, the emergence of the Free Presbyterian Church. 1900, the Union. 1904, the House of Lords decision. 
but even to generations yet unborn. Pardon our many sins now for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs> Let us sing now to God's praise from Psalm 122. Psalm 122. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me, Jerusalem, within thy gates thou feet shall standing be. Jerusalem as a city is compactly built together. And to that place the tribes go up, the tribes of God go thither, to Israel's testimony, there to God's name thanks to pay. The thrones of judgment, even the thrones of David's house, they say. Pray that Jerusalem may have peace and felicity, that them that love thee and thy peace have still prosperity. Therefore I wish that peace may still within thy walls remain, and ever may thy palaces prosperity retain. Now for my friends and brethren's sake, peace be in thee, I'll say, and for the house of God, our Lord, I'll seek thy good always. The whole psalm, I joy, friend to the house of God, go up, they say to me. I joy, friend to the house of God, go
the monthly meeting tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock and the uh, Kirk Session and Deacon's Court will meet after that meeting. The prayer meetings at the usual time, Shabbat here at 7 p.m. and Wednesday and Braga at 7 p.m. Thursday. The services next Sabbath at the usual times at um, Gaelic 12 noon here and English at 6 p.m. and Gaelic in Braga at 6 p.m. And next Saturday will be the Shabbat Sabbath school outing. The bus will leave from the junction of the main road in South Shabbat and will walk to the whole community. The bus will leave from that end at 10.30 and the intention is to go to Gary Sands. These are all the information. May may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Spirit be with you all.